tonight, Minister Shirlene Williamson. Praise God. Praise the Lord, church. <laughs> Amen. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. If we can take our Bibles and go directly into the word of the Lord tonight. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And I definitely thank Brother Leo for that wonderful introduction. I don't know if all those things are true, but, but, but thank you anyhow. <laughs> Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Amen. We're glad to have our pastor with us. When he's not here, we feel it. <laughs> Amen. And we thank him for his encouraging words. I know he was talking to the young people, but I felt as if he was talking to me as well. So we want to thank God for our bishop. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may shew him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he? And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul I may shew kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is, he is in the house of Mashir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mashir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely shew thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, saith the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. And lastly, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. I know it's kind of a lengthy portion, but uh, for a topic tonight, we're going to look at stay with the king and live. Stay with the king and live. And we're going to ask our pastor if he can pray for us, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for Minister Shirlene. Lord, your hand is on her. She's your handmaiden. Use her for your glory, Lord God. Pour out fresh anointing on her. Cause her to preach with power and with demonstration of the Spirit. Challenge us and change us, Lord God Almighty. Save tonight. Deliver, heal. Help us to stay with the King and live as we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. There is a quote from uh, Dr. Seuss that says, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. And so comical as it may seem, it is true in its entirety. We as humans have been blessed with the power of free will. And I believe that sometimes the angels envy us for this. We have the ability to choose where we're going to go, perhaps what we're going to eat that day, what we're going to wear and put on. And, and we have so many decisions that we're able to make 
because we have the ability and the power of free will. Even little kids have some degree of choosing and free will. Parents, depending on their ages, may give them certain options. And so if you have a, a little child, maybe a, a three or a four-year-old, you may kind of ask them, well, what would you like you know, for breakfast? And uh, depending on their age, you, know, you may not want to leave that question open like that because they may just say, well, I want candy or ice cream, uh, like my child would say. But maybe, you know, depending on the age, you may say, well, you know, would you like some cereal or oatmeal? You know, pick one or the other. And then the older we get, the more uh, opportunity we have to make decisions in our lives. As we become preteens, we may have the ability to start picking our clothes. When we become teenagers and young adults, we, we start to weigh the option of college. What are we gonna do after high school? Are we gonna go straight into the workforce? Are we gonna do some trade school? What are we gonna do with our lives? And then of course, when we, became full, when we become full grown adults, then we have all the decisions and all the options available to us. And we have to decide where we're going to live. We have to decide maybe where we're going to work. We have to decide maybe is marriage for us? Is it in our future? To marry or to marry, not marry, that is the question. Are we gonna choose to have children? How many? What extracurricular activities are we going to choose to spend our money on and what are we gonna to choose to get involved in? And so we have all of these decisions weighing in on us and we have to decide. But I believe that one of the most important things that we will ever get to decide is whether we're going to choose to live our lives for God or whether we're going to choose to live for the devil. And so the choice is ours tonight, young people. The choice is yours. Who are you going to live your life out for? And so in our text, we find the story of Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it kind of gives us a background to this Mephibosheth character. It tells us what has happened to him. And if you may not know the story is, he ended up being disabled, lame on both of his feet because he was dropped by his nurse when they found out that uh, Abner, the general of Israel, had died at that time. His nurse, knowing what was about to take place, that a new king was getting ready to be ushered in, she made haste and fled for her life and for the life of Mephibosheth because Usually when a new king is ushered in, they kind of kill off all of the remnants of the old king. And so she knew that Mephibosheth's life was in danger. And so, you know, she had good intentions and she fled, but in her haste, she dropped him. And that ended up making him become disabled for the rest of her life. And so this is probably how Mephibosheth ends up in the land of Lodabar. And this is probably where he remained until King David went and called for him. And this is where our text opens up. And in this encounter that Mephibosheth has with King David, he ends up receiving three things from King David. And tonight, I just want to point out those three things uh, to your attention. And I believe that those same three things are things that we are able to, to obtain from the king even today. And so firstly, in this encounter with King David, we see that the king grants him pardon. The king grants him pardon. In verse 6 of the text, the king calls for him. King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mashir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. So he goes and he calls for, for Mephibosheth. Now, if we can uh, put the first map on the um, screen right here, I just wanted to kind of show you uh, where Lodabar is located in relationship to um, Jerusalem, where David was at the time. And so what you see here, this map is the map of the divisions of the tribe of Israel. And you see those two yellow, big yellow spots right there on either side. That's the tribe of Manasseh. Now, Lodabar is located in Manasseh, 
I was not able to find a map with loader bars showing the different tribes, but I, so I had to show it to you in two, tri two maps. And so if we can go to the second map, and you see right there where loader bar is, and you see where Jerusalem is located. And so there, that's where uh, this land of loader bar is. And so this name loader bar, the name ha is consisting of two parts. Lo, which is a common particle of neg negation meaning no or not. And so the low means no or not. Um, and it's often used sometimes in a low ami, meaning not my people, or low ruma, meaning no mercy. And then the dabar part means uh, pasture. And sometimes it is uh, translated with word. So it's either, it either means word or pasture. And so if you kind of put them together, low the bar, no pasture or no word. And so it's without pasture, or without the word of God. And so this is where Mephibosheth was staying. This, this is where he was living. He was living in a place where there was no word from God for his soul. He was living in a place where he was not able to get pasture to feed his soul. This is where he was. And then, as if to add insult to injury, his very name, Mephibosheth, means shame. It means shame. And so here you have it, this guy who is really supposed to be a prince. He's from the genealogy of Saul and Jonathan, living in Lodabar, a place that is devoid of pasture, a place that is devoid of the word of God, couldn't hear from God even if he wanted to because of his location. This is exactly where we end up when we are in sin, people of God. It causes us to be without pasture. We're, we're unable to hear from God. Romans chapter 3 verse 15 says, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have churned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so our feet sometimes have a way of getting us into trouble. Even if it's not our own feet, the feet of somebody else, as in the case of Mephibosheth, his nurse dropped him. It was not his fault. And sometimes, young people, if you're honest, you cave to peer pressure. The people that are around you, things that you probably normally would not give into because the other people, the feet of the other people, egging you on and, and leading you into destruction, you just kind of give in. And so sometimes we find ourselves in these types of predicament. predicament. But sometimes it's our own feet that carries us off into trouble and and getting us into things that we really have no business doing and, and getting us going to places that we really should not go. In God's eyes, the fall of Adam and Eve has caused all of humanity to be crippled. And so whether you want to see yourself like Mephibosheth or not, this is the exact state that we are in our sin. God has banished Adam and Eve from the garden because of their obedience. They were dropped from grace. And some of us, even beyond that, we've been dropped. Whether you've been dropped by your parents, young people, maybe they have abandoned you, abused you, rejected you, or some of us, maybe we've been dropped by our spouses, vows have been broken, some of us have been dropped by our employers. We've been let go on the job. We've been dropped by society. They say that if you're not the best, you're just like the rest. And so there's nothing special about you. We're just going to cut you like that. We've been dropped by our education, the degree that maybe we worked so hard to obtain. And it's really not doing anything for us. Can't even land us a, a decent job. We've been dropped by our family, our relatives, nobody to care for us. And so we're in this state of woundedness and, and brokenness. And really, we're unable to live independently of God. And, and this is how we are before God, people of God. We're, we're broken. 
disabled, lame on both of our feet, having no pasture, not able to get a word from God. But I know that someone in here can testify tonight that I went to a meeting one night and, and my heart wasn't right, but, but something got a hold of me. And, and that something was King Jesus. He got a hold of my life. Nobody can come to the king except he draw him. And God was there drawing some of us. He was drawing us. It's not because you were in the right place at the right time. Anybody can be in an apostolic church and the music is going and the choir is singing and the word of God is coming forth and they still don't end up saved. But it was because the king issued you an invitation. It was because the king was calling your name. And that is why you are able to come into the house and to receive salvation for your souls. That's why you felt the power of the Holy Ghost so strong like you did. That's why it was as if the preacher was speaking right to you. As if God was speaking to you that same night. It was because the king was drawing you to the table. It was because the king had left his place, sent messengers to fetch you from Lodabar, to fetch you from your state of helplessness, to fetch you from your state of sin, to fetch you from where you were, and to come into the palace to be able to live with him forevermore. It's not because we were good. It's not because we deserved any of it. But it is all because of the king. It is all because of the king. And so God was standing right there saying, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And so God went and he fetched us from Lodabar to give us an opportunity, an opportunity to be able to be with him in the palace forevermore. I mean, we were enemies. Mephibosheth was David's enemy. Really, he should have tried to kill Mephibosheth. Really, we are enemies of God. We are at enmity with the cross. But while the Lord was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. While he was on the cross, he reached down deep to the love that he had for us to be able to issue us that invitation. And now we have a royal pardon from the king himself. Now we have the ability to come into the house of the Lord and to rejoice. Now we can worship. Now I can lift up my hands free from chains, free from sin, free from the yoke of bondage, and I can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth because I have received a royal pardon from none other than the king himself. Jesus came and he called for me. I remember the very day. I remember the time, the hour where I stood at that altar and God was calling my name. I remember him calling me, drawing me nigh to the cross. I remember that day. And if you would be honest, you could think back to where you were too. You know what you were doing before the cross? Living on the streets. Living a life of promiscuity, lying, cheating, stealing just because you could, messed up, had all types of things going on in your life, but the king was calling your name. The king issued you a royal pardon. The king was standing there drawing you to the foot of the cross saying, come on, come on, come into the house. Come on, leave that old lifestyle behind. Why don't you just drop that? I have a royal pardon for you. I have plans for you. I have something so much more in store for you. And so the king was there to issue us a royal pardon, and I'm glad about it. I don't know how you feel about it tonight, people of God, but I'm glad to be saved. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm glad to be free. I can lift up my hands and worship unto the Lord. I thank the Lord for that royal pardon. I thank the king. I'm going to stay with the king because there is life with the king. There is life with the king. And so we've got to stay with the king. Stay with the king, people of God. I thank him every day for his forgiveness. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? I'll tell you where I would be. I'd still be in Lodabar. I would still be in sin. I'd still be in a state of helplessness. I'd still be lost. But thank God for the cross. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for salvation. And I can stand before you today whole because the king has issued.
issued me a royal pardon. And I thank God every day. Every day I thank him. And we ought to thank him for this royal pardon. Secondly, the king gives restoration. If we can go to verse 7 of our text, the king gives restoration. Thank you, Lord. And David said unto him, fear not, for I will surely shew thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Verse 8. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and all his house. And so we see here that King David restored everything back to Mephibosheth, everything that belonged to Saul, everything that belonged to Jonathan was given to Mephibosheth. And furthermore, he received a standing invitation to eat at the king's table for the rest of his life. And so really, this was no small gesture. Saul was a king, and him being a king, he had a lot of wealth, owned a lot of land, a lot of houses and property. And so for David to restore to Mephibosheth all of those things, that's saying a lot. It's not like he gave him one or two houses or a couple acres of land. I mean, he bestowed upon him a huge, huge favor. He received a lot. And really, it was Mephibosheth to begin with. Because usually, you know, when the parents own something and they die, it usually passes on to the children. And so really, it belonged to him anyway. The thing about restoration is, in order to be restored to something, it had to have first belonged to you in the first place. And so you can't really be restored to something that doesn't belong to you. It has to have belonged to you in some kind of way, shape, or form. And so all of this land that was given unto him had first belonged to his father or to his grandfather. But the thing about it is how he lost it is in fleeing for his life. Of course, due to no fault of his own, he kind of abdicated or he left it when he fled. And so that is how he lost it. When God created our first parents in the garden, he created Adam and Eve to have dominion and authority over the earth. But with the fall, they ended up being banished from the garden, put out in Lodabar, if you will. Signing over their rights and their dominion and all the power that had been given to them in the first place. And we know who in, ended up with the power. And that's why when we are born and we're facing away from God, it's because of our first parents. And we're born with no power, with no authority, with, with really nothing. Nothing to live for God because of this fall. But when we come to God... And after we have received this royal pardon, then God begins this process of restoration. And we begin to start being restored back to that dominion. We begin to start being restored back to that power and that authority that belonged to us in the first place. And I know we, we, we kind of have a hard time understanding this. Sometimes we go through things that we really would not be going through if we understand the power that we held because of the Holy Ghost that we have inside of us. He said that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And so this is the power to live right. This is the power to walk right. This is the power to say to that mountain, be thou removed, and it's going to move. This is the power to tread over the head of that old serpent. This is the power that belonged to us in the first place. God said, I'm going to restore that power back unto you, but you got to stay with the king. You have to stay with the king. And the sooner we realize that we have power, the better off we're going to be. 
And so sometimes when we're in this land of Lodabar, away from God, in this state of helplessness and, and in this broken and wounded state, sometimes we end up doing things and getting ourselves into situations that sometimes are irreversible. And we end up doing things that later we're even ashamed to tell other people of, like, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. And some of those things produce consequences. Maybe a pregnancy or STI or a terminal disease from drinking, drinking yourself almost to death. And we feel that even though we have received this royal pardon, even though we have forgiveness from the king, that some things we, we, we just can't recover from. But God says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And so you know what that tells me, people of God? It doesn't matter what I did out there. It doesn't matter how bad my sin was out there. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. There is no state of helplessness, helplessness from which we cannot recover. God said, I will restore those years back unto you. I will restore those things back unto you. That's just the kind, of, kind of, the kind of king that we serve, a God of restoration. He's able to restore. He's able to mend. He's able to put those things back together that we have broken. God is a God of restoration. And so there's no sin that he cannot forgive. Scripture says, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall become white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Why? Because God, our King, is able to bring restoration unto our lives. And so those things that I did, that I'm ashamed of, those things that I did that produced irreversible consequences, God said, you don't have to worry about those things much longer. You don't have to worry about them because I'm going to restore those years. I'm going to start in your life the process of restoration, and I'm going to get you to a place where you have dominion. I'm going to get you to a place where you have authority in the spirit. I'm going to get you to a place where you can hold your head up high, where you don't have to walk with your head hung low because the Lord is the lifter up of my head. He is the lifter up of your head, and so I don't have to walk around saying, woe is me, woe is me, I can't recover. God said, I will restore unto you those years. I'm going to restore everything, everything that the devil took from you, everything that you ever gave up to him. I'm going to restore those things back unto you. That's just the kind of God I am. I'm the God of restoration. I will restore those things back unto you. The children sing a song. I'm walking in authority, living life without apology. It's not wrong, dear. I belong here. So you might as well get used to it. You better get used to it, devil. I belong here. And I'm going to stomp all over your head. I am now in the place of authority. I am now in the place where I can hold my head up high. I belong here. It's not big enough for the both of us, so you best get the steppings, devil, because I'm here now in restoration. God has restored me back onto the place of favor, back onto the place where I was supposed to be in the first place. Restoration is mine. Whatever you have lost unto the devil, whatever he took from you, you can go and claim that thing. You can go and you just take, you don't even have to ask him. It doesn't belong to him in the first place. It belongs to you and I. And so I'm just going to go and I'm just going to take it. It's mine, devil. It doesn't belong to you. I'm going to take that thing. It's mine in the first place. And so if you lost your joy, if you lost your peace, if you lost your dedication to the house of the Lord, if you lost your prayer life, go get it. Go to the camp of the enemy. Snatch that thing out of the hand of the devil. Go get it. It's yours. It's mine. It belongs to us. It belongs to you. Go get it. Hallelujah. Go get it. The Lord is on our side. That means I'm on the winning side. I'm on the winning team. We read the back of the...
the book, we win. We're going to win. And so the victory belongs to us. Nothing that devil can do. Nothing those demons from hell can do. No weapon formed against you and I can prosper. But we have the victory in Jesus because we can stay with the king and we're going to live. We have a life with King Jesus. Stay with the king and live. Don't you go out there, but stay with the king. You will find restoration with the king. He is able to restore. He is able to bring you back to that place that you never imagined that you could go back to. Stay with the king. Stay with the king. There is life with the king. There is favor with the king. There is forgiveness with the king. There is pardon with the king. There is restoration with the king. And so I'm going to stay with the king. I'm going to stay with the king and live. Stay with the king. I know that devil tells you that you don't deserve that. You don't belong there. But you just tell that, oh, yes, I do belong here. My, do you know who my daddy is? My dad is the king of glory, the king of kings. All power is in his hand. And so that makes me royalty. I'm a child of the king. I'm a son of the king. I'm a daughter of the king. I belong here. I belong in this place of authority. I belong here, devil. Restoration is yours. It belongs to the people of God. And so the king is able to restore. Hallelujah. He's able to restore. If we can consider the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go thou in thine household and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines. And she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, my Lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, so the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. And so you have in this story this Shunammite woman that Elisha had prayed for her son and brought her son back to life. He ends up coming to a place where he tells her, Look, there's going to be a famine in the land for seven years. Don't stay here. Go somewhere else. And so her and her family, they decide to go into the land of the Philistines. And in doing so, she left all of her property. And so it was, it was no longer hers. And so she's living in the land of uh, the Philistines for these seven years. And at the end of the seven years, she packs up her belongings and she decides to return back home to the land of Israel. And when she does so, she really couldn't just go up into the house and be like, okay, this is my house. It's probably somebody else was living there, and so it kind of was no longer hers. And so she goes to the king, and she petitions the king, hey, I want to know if I can get my land back. You know, I, I need this land. And it just so happened that while she went to petition the king, that Gehazi, Elisha's old servant, was there telling the king about all the great things that Elisha had done. And while Elisha was telling the king about her, and the son that he raised from the dead that was hers, here she comes in. And she's like, hey, I need my land back. And the king, I don't know if it was because Gehazi was already speaking to him about her, he's like, sure thing, you can have your land back, and appointed her an officer. But in addition to that, 
Not only did she just get her land and her houses and, and so forth, but the king said, I'm going to do something special for you. I am going to allow you to have all of the increase, all of the income, everything that came from the crops that your land produced in your absence. And so, I mean, this is the restoration of all restorations right here. And so not only was she giving her home and her land back, but even the thing that she didn't work for, even the, the money and the food that she did not cultivate, the king said, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you anyway. I know you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. And so God is able to restore unto us even the things that we didn't work for. But he's like, because I'm the king and because I have the power to do so and you are my child, I think I'm going to go ahead and give that to you anyway because I love you so. And so she was able to get a huge restoration. She had income from the seven years that she didn't even work the land. She had crops and food there waiting for her in that house. I mean, even... In the year of Jubilee, where the people and the slaves and the captives were allowed to go back to their homes and their lands, even they did not receive the income that was produced while they were away. But this Shunammite woman received a special blessing. God said, I have a special restoration in store for you. I have this special thing that I want to do in your life. And so people of God, God has a special restoration in place for us. And so even though sometimes we think, man, I've just gone too far. I I overdid it this time, Lord. I can't recover. I've gone too far. I've I've gone over the edge. There's, There's no way I can make it back. But God said, yes, you can. Don't you listen to that old devil whispering those wicked thoughts in your ear. God said, I am able to restore those years back unto you that the locust has eaten, that the canker worm has eaten, that the palmer worm has eaten. I can give those things back unto you again. But you got to stay in my house. You got to remain with the king. You got to dwell with me all the days of your life. You got to stay in the house of the Lord. You can't get the restoration and go out in the world. It doesn't work like that. The restoration is only for those that are in the house. The restoration is only for those that are abiding with the king. And so we have to abide with the king in order to get that special restoration. And so after seven years, it doesn't matter if it was 15 years that you were out there, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years smoking your life away. God is able, the king is able to restore those 30 years back unto you. He can give you those 14 years back. He can add another 50 years to your life. He can restore everything that you lost. Everything that was taken away. My God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. And so even if I can't imagine it, even if I can't perceive it, even if I can't dream it, God is still able. He can still bring it to pass. He can still restore. The king is able to restore. Psalms 23 verse 3 says, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And so everything that I've lost, everything that was once mine, God can restore it back and put me back in the place of dominion and authority if I stay with him. Thirdly, The king gives provision in life. The king gives provision in life. If we can pull up verse 10 of our text. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then says Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, saith the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. 
And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Misha. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. And so we see here in the scripture that Mephibosheth receives an open invitation to always dine with the king. And so even though he was restored back unto him his land and he had servants and he had riches and and wealth now, King David says, look, I, I want you to eat with me every day. Eat, feast with me. Because, you know, you, the king usually has the best food. You know, it doesn't matter how wealthy and rich you are. You, you're probably not eating better than the king. And so the king is like, look, dine with me every day. I know you got your own servants. You got your own riches. But I want you to come and eat in the palace every single day. And so this was not just a once or a twice thing, but this is a regular occurrence. And so here you have it. The man that was once made a shame came to have an open invitation to always dine with the king. The king issues us this same invitation in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And so God is also issuing us this invitation. We used to sing a song. Come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. Joy is here where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. I'm so glad that I can count on the Lord to provide this table of feasting for me. And he has become my Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He allows me to feast at his table. Now, the first time we see Jehovah Jireh, it is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. And in this chapter here, this is where God tells Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac unto me. Your one and only son that I gave you, I want him back. And so Abraham is like, well, you know, I probably really don't want to do this, but nevertheless, He obeys, and he's on his way up the mountain to sacrifice his one and his only son Isaac at the request of the Lord. And if we can pull up that scripture, starting in verse 8, I believe. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place where God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, and behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And so we see this Jehovah Jireh appearing in verse 14 for the first time in scripture, which means that the Lord will provide or the Lord is our provider. And at the end of verse 14, it says, in the mount of the Lord, it, it, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And what that is referring to is out of that, there kind of arose a proverb from that event and from that saying. And that proverb is really saying, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, or in the mount of Jehovah it shall be provided, telling us that the Lord, our Jehovah, our King, is able to provide for us. But if we wish to have our needs supplied, we're going to have to be able to live with the King. 
It's like if you're hungry and you go to a restaurant and you just kind of sit in your car. And as much as you may be starving to death, if you don't really go inside, you're, still, you're not able to partake of that food. If you go to the bank to take out money and you're not going through the ATM and you're just, you're just sitting outside, the building is right there and you're just right in front of the building, you're just sitting. You know, and you're needing the cash, and the cash is there, but if you don't go inside, you're not able to access that cash. And so in the same manner, if we will not ascend to the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place, God's provision is not made available to us. We have to get near to God in order to be partakers of what he has in store for us. That's why we got to stay with the king. That's why we have to have fellowship with him. We have to have communion with the king. Amen. Now, when the Lord steps into this situation with Abraham, look at when he tells Abraham to, 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 put the, to not uh, uh, touch Isaac. If we can go, I believe, um, yes, verse 12. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. But that, that was already when Abraham had the knife in his hand. So here you have Abraham with the knife about to slay his one and only son. And here comes God. Abraham, Abraham, you don't have to do that anymore. Now I know that you're going to fear me. And so isn't that just like God? He'll come right in the nick of time. Not five days before, but right there, right before you're about to do the deed. Now I know. Now I know I can trust you. Now I know that you will live for me. Now I know that you love me with all of your heart. But, Lord, didn't you know this five days ago? You know, you had to put me through all this trouble. Yes, yes, I did have to put you through all that stuff, that trouble. So right in the nick of time. And so we say that God is always on time. He may not come when we want him to come. But trust, believe that he's not going to be late either. He's going to be right on time. Right on time. Sometimes they tell us that it's not always what you know, but who you know. And this is pretty apparent when it comes to the workplace. If you need a job and you know the manager or you know the recruiter or know somebody up in there, you might have a shot. Um, and so you could just call them, say, hey, y'all got any openings? You know, let me know. Can you slip my resume through? Can you give me an interview, you know? Help a sister out, you know? Let me know. What's up? What's the deal? And so, you know, if you kind of know somebody on the inside, you, you may end up with an interview or you may just end up with a job without the interview. And so sometimes it's not what you know, but it's who you know. <clears throat> and we know the king. <laughs> we know the king of kings. <laughs> We know King Jesus, and so he has allowed us to be in a place of favor. And so sometimes I don't need to know anything. I just need to know the king. Sometimes I don't need to know how it's going to work out. I just need to know that I know the king. I'm in good standings with the king. I have fellowship with the king. And so he's going to allow me to be in a place of favor. He's going to allow things to come my way that I really don't deserve. But because I know the king, but because I know who he is, and because I live with him and I have sweet communion with him, I can get access to certain things that other people can't get access to because they don't know the king. And so sometimes it's who you know. The Bible says that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And so because I know the king and because I am in good standings with the king, God is just going to transfer over that wealth. God is just going to transfer over that promotion. God is just going to transfer over that possession. He's just going to transfer over those homes in that place of favor and give it unto us because we know the king. Oh, come on. Are you excited about that? Are you excited because you know the king? You know who he is? We know the king tonight. And I thank the Lord. We know the king. And so whatever it is that we need, we don't have to be afraid to go before the throne of God. We can go before God boldly. We can go before the king because we know him. And we can ask those
those things. We can bring our petitions before the king and know without a shot of a doubt, God is hearing me. And know without a shot of a doubt, he will supply. The king is able to give you everything that you need and so much more. The earth is his. The world belongs to him. All the gold is his. The silver is his. The cattle upon a thousand hills is his. Everything belongs to the king. And so if I need something, if I have a need, I can go to the king and rest assured. Surely God is hearing me. Surely he's going to bring it to pass. Surely he's going to do this thing wherewith I am asking him because I know the king. I know the king. And so I don't have to lay up in the bed at night worrying how the bills are going to get paid have more bills and I do money. I don't have to suffer a panic attack. I don't have to go into depression. I don't have to stay up late at night saying, God, how am I going to do this? I know the king. I don't know about you, but I know the king. And I can take it to the Lord in prayer. God is going to supply all of my needs, everything that I ask, all of my heart's desires. The king is able to supply. The king is able to bring it to pass. I know the king. Matthew chapter 26, 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat in the body? Then raiment, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father, the King, feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the valley of the field how they grow they toil not neither do they spin and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these and so Solomon I know you're rich but you got nothing on these lilies right here that God is providing for wherefore if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the heaven shall he not much more clothe you Oh, ye of little faith, wherefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. But your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so if I can just abide with the king, if I can just stay in the house of the Lord, if I can just stay in his presence, if I can stay on good terms with the king, God will supply every one of my needs. God will supply. God will make sure those bills are paid. God will make sure you have food on your table. God will take care of those kids. God will look after that house. God is going to do it. The king will supply. The king will supply. He will supply every one of your needs. He will supply. I don't have to worry. I don't have to stay late up at night, anxious, not knowing what I'm going to do. But the king, I know the king, and I know he will supply. I know that he's able. The king will supply. God is able to supply. I don't know why he does it, but he supplies all of my needs. I don't need to figure it out, but the king is going to supply. One thing I know is I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed on the job. I'm blessed everywhere that I go. I'm blessed in that car. God has his hand of protection on me. God has his hand of mercy providing for me. God is procuring my life. I'm going to stay with the king. I'm going to stay with the king and live. This is how you procure life, by staying with the king. There is no life outside of the king. 
I just want to serve the Lord. I don't care if I'm an usher in the house of the Lord, a greeter. I don't care what it is God has me doing, but long as I can serve the king. Lord, let me just serve you. I don't need to be up here. I can be cleaning the house. I can serve the Lord anywhere. Lord, let me just serve you in the house. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. I just want to dwell in the house. I just want to remain in his presence. Lord, I just want to be with the king. Long as I got King Jesus, you can take everything that I have, but give me the king. Give me the giver of all life, the king himself. Stay with the king and live. David says, I have been young. And now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen a seed begging for bread. And so if I stay in the house of the Lord, there is nothing that I need that God will not supply. Nothing. And so as I get ready to close, I bring up that quote that I started with, that Dr. Seuss said, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 says, see I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So the choice is yours, people of God. You can choose to stay in the world, have all the fun that your heart can take, whatever pleasures you want to take part in. You can choose to do that, but just know that you're going to be lost. There is no life in that. Or you can choose the road less traveled. You can choose the less glamorous route. You can choose to stay with the king, but in staying with the king, you're going to have a life and life more abundantly. I don't know what you're going to do, people of God, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I don't know what route you're contemplating tonight, young people, but I'm going to remain in the house of the Lord all the days of my life because I know that when I'm sick, I can get healing in the presence of the king. I know that when I'm tired, I can get strength and restoration in the presence of the king. In his presence, there's a table made for me where I can go and dine and feast at the table of the king. He gives me peace like a river. He is my joy giver. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I'm better being a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord because one day with the Lord, even if I'm at my lowest point, is better than a thousand days elsewhere as some actress or some famous celebrity with all the money in the world. Just one day in the house of the Lord at my lowest point is better than a thousand days elsewhere. It's better than all of those days. Mephibosheth later on in the scripture, he had an opportunity to get away from King David, to get from under that covering when King David was fleeing from Absalom, his son. But Mephibosheth said, no, I'm not about to do that. I recognize where the source of my strength is coming from. I know that without him, I am nothing. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. There is no life outside of the king and so sometimes we may get to a place where we appear to be far from that state of Lodabar we may appear to be far from that place where we were in sin that place where we first got saved at 
But let's not forget that if it was not for God, if it was not for the king, you would not be in that place. And so we have to always keep this in mind lest we stray away from the king. He was always calling my name while I was sitting in Lodabar, helpless, broken, looking for a savior, looking for someone to come to my rescue. I was just a dead dog in his presence. But I'm so glad that he issued me that royal pardon and I accepted that invitation and I've been feasting at his table ever since. And so people of God, I'm going to stay with the king and live. We have a good thing going here. Let's not mess that up. A great salvation has been given unto us. And so I'm not about to leave the house of the Lord for nothing. No money, no fame, not a member of the opposite sex. Nothing is going to take me out of the house of the Lord because there is no life outside of the king. There is only life with King Jesus. And so young people, I know they may talk about you in your schools. I know they may make fun of you, your belief, your faith, how you look, the fact that you're not like them and you don't fit in, that's all right. Because you have a life, you have everlasting life. And so even if we just endure, that for just a little while it's just for a little season after a while I'm going to rejoice in eternity with the king and I will be with him forevermore there is life with the king and so I don't know where you are tonight people of God if God is speaking to your heart young people and you need to rededicate yourself unto the Lord maybe you've gotten away from your dedication You've gotten away from your commitment. Other things have preoccupied your mind. But God is here saying, you have to stay with me. You got to stay with me. You got to endure. Don't you go out in your backslide and you do all types of stuff. Stay with the king. You don't have to experience those things that are out there. They say experience is the best teacher, but you don't have to experience those things to know that there is no life on those streets. There is no life in promiscuity. There is no life outside of the king. And so I'm going to stay where I'm at. I'm going to stay with the king of glory. I'm going to stay with the king of kings. For God I live and for God I'll die. And so the altars are open if you need a place to pray. The king is here. He has pardon for you. He has restoration for you. And he has provision for you. But you got to stay with the king because that is how you're going to live.